Welcome, welcome everybody. Welcome. Uh, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Uh, come on in. This is going to be a lively conversation. I hope you're sitting or standing in a comfortable space. I hope you got your notebook out because uh, we've got Reverend Ben McBride on the line. So this is going to be awesome. Um, as people are trickling in, I want to invite you, as always, to pay attention to two features that are really important for a global immersion webinar. One is the, the chat feature, the comment section. Uh, I want to invite you right now, wherever you're calling in from around the, the country or the world, go ahead and put in, uh, in that chat feature your name and where you're calling in from. If you're comfortable with that, it gives us an opportunity to see where you are and who you are and, uh, and, and link up with one another. Um, as is always the case for us uh, in a global immersion webinar, this is a living document. This is, uh, this is where you capture compelling quotes and ideas that emerge over the next hour. This is where, as resources come to mind, feel free, feel free to post links in there for us all to be able to share with one another um, along the way. Um, this will also be helpful for those of you who are listening in uh, in the recorded version. We always like to harvest these resources and make them available to you as well. And so for those of you who are listening to the recording of this, um, welcome into Restoring Friendship Part 3 with Ben McBride. The second feature um, is down in the Q&A space. You'll see it at the bottom uh, of your screen. And that's an important space for this conversation as things come alive for you. Uh, there's going to be uh, thoughts that are going to be provocative, wonderings that you're going to have. Put them in the Q&A, and uh, Ben and I are going to do our best to chew on those with you. Um, but they're also going to serve as some of the content for the live debrief session that's going to happen on Tuesday evening, June the 8th. And so out of this series, we're having this experience where we can explore this way of interpersonal peacemaking, and then we're having live debrief sessions that I'm facilitating uh, with 25 people. So get your spot now. And, and I'm actually going to put this um, in the chat thread right now um, so that you can see this uh, at our link tree. You can go ahead and register for that live debrief session that's going to happen on June the 8th from 6 to 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And so some of the questions that emerge there, we're going to dive in uh, in a deeper way in that live debrief session. I want to say a special thank you to the Embers community. This is our group of monthly sustainers who invest in peace and you make resources like these accessible and available to the masses. So thank you, Embers, for, um, for believing in the work that we're doing. My name is Jer Swigert. I'm the co-founder of the Global Immersion Project. We're a peacemaking training organization that's oriented around Jesus. And, uh, and our work is to develop everyday peacemakers to join God and others in making all things new. Um, from our point of view, everyday peacemakers are women and men who are learning to see more accurately, immerse more courageously, and contend more creatively. Let me break those down in a little bit more detail because you're going to hear these three practices emerge in what Ben brings to the table. Um, see more accurately. We acknowledge as peacemakers that our perspective is not 2020 vision uh, and that the healing of our sight is a lifelong endeavor. It's a lifelong in, a journey that involves learning and it involves relationship and it involves experience. And so in the midst of those three things, we believe that the spirit of the risen one is constantly healing our sight, helping us to see more accurately, immerse more courageously. That means that peacemakers, we step off the road of comfort. We displace ourselves off the road of comfort and into reality. Um, and, and we do this with relational and transformational intention. That means that we're not displacing ourselves in order to observe or to consume but rather we're displacing ourselves in order to form relationships and where we all find ourselves transformed. And then third, contend more creatively. We recognize as peacemakers that the, heart, the work of justice is not an individual endeavor. It's a costly collaboration. And as we say at Global Immersion, we have no idea how to contend, whether internally, interpersonally, or systemically, until we first seen and immersed. And so it's our conviction that as we become people who learn to see, immerse, and contend, we're finding ourselves joining God and others in the work of restoration around us. Um, we don't see peacemaking as, uh, as an add-on to our faith. We actually see it as the essence of it. And in other words, it's not a hobby. It's a restorative way of life. And so everything that we do as an organization is meant to design, is meant to develop the whole person into the way uh, of peacemaking. We see conflict as inevitable. We see injustice in all of its forms as seeking to diminish the image of God in another. Uh, we see conflict and injustice playing out internally, interpersonally, and systemically. So that means it's happening inside of me. 
It's happening between us and it's happening within the infrastructure that seeks to organize us. And so while we see the work of peacemaking absolutely committed to the work of systems change, we also see the, the work of peacemaking as the hard work of becoming whole, more integrated, healthy human beings who become savvy at navigating hard conversations, tending to interrupted relationships and then bridging difference into new ones. Or put another way, uh, the road to systemic change only ever goes by way of internal and interpersonal peacemaking. And so in everything that Global Immersions uh, does, we train you to walk this road with wisdom and ever at the pace of love. Uh, and so that brings me to the Restoring Friendship webinar series, and this is part three. Uh, we, uh, we, we really are focusing this conversation on that second part, that the interpersonal peacemaking, and, and here's why. It just seems like the reality of relationships all around all of us are fragile and fatigued. And, and if I've had the conversation once, I've had it a hundred times, like how do, I, how do I mend an interrupted relationship? Or how do I bridge difference into a friendship with someone who, um, who thinks or believes or worships differently uh, than I do? And so in this series, we're addressing that. And the way that we're doing it is we're just inviting some of our global colleagues into the conversation. And, and these are women and men who you have all paid attention to um, throughout the years. They're involved in some really extraordinary work, um, but they're also human beings who are committed to the work of everyday peacemaking internally, interpersonally, as well as systemically. And so uh, a couple of weeks ago, we had Australian-based peacemaker Jared McKenna offer a pastoral invitation to allow the spirit of the resurrected one to disarm us and to unshame us and to relax us into the revolution a little bit more. Oshita Moore uh, joined us last week with a riveting word, very practical around how she does the grit and grace of tending interpersonal relationships. And then uh, today we have my brother Ben McBride, um, who's going to talk to us about the priority of belonging and how it is that we bridge difference in order to pursue this belonging that's actually rooted uh, in our tradition as people of faith. Uh, on June 10th, we'll have Robbie Damlin from Israel, which will be another really important conversation, especially in light of all that's happening over there uh, in Israel and Palestine. And then we'll close uh, on July the 1st with Padre Gotuma out of, uh, out of Ireland. These are going to be unique perspectives around the work of, of interpersonal peacemaking. And so in the link tree, uh, I want to invite you to pre-register uh, for those uh, for parts four and five as well. And so that's, um, that's what we have in store for us uh, today. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let Ben introduce himself. But before I do, um, <laughs> every time I'm on the line with you, Ben, I'm, I reflect on that one time when, um, when a mutual friend linked us together. <laughs> you came out to Walnut Creek and, and we sat at just this bougie restaurant <laughs> together and, um, and, and met and began to talk. And within, for me at least, it felt like within the opening paragraphs of our stories with one another, it felt like this was, um, this was gonna be a really meaningful relationship. And it, and it certainly has. We've traveled the world together. We've studied peacemaking together. We've been in the streets together. Uh, and we've been on screens together uh, a number of times. And so it's a real gift to, um, to be back together with you in this space. And so, bro, um, introduce yourself. Talk a little bit about your life, uh, a little bit about your work, and why this particular conversation matters to you. Yeah, well, it's cool. It's good to be back in the space with you, man. Um, I laugh when I, when, I, when I thought back to that cafe we were in in, in Walnut Creek. You were, you were sitting in the corner, probably had a pad and some devices. And, and uh, I was, you know, it's... it's interesting because I think as I was coming in I was trying to figure out okay what, what can I expect in this conversation with this with this young white brother with his moose up hair about five <laughs> inches off the top of his head and we're eating some seven dollar croissants but it, it certainly has been a, a good relationship um yeah I mean I, I'm, I'm Ben McGrath I'm the founder of Empower Initiative uh which is a formation organization really focused on empowering uh, people, uh, communities, organizations to think about how we actually uh, create and foster belonging, uh, not just in our interpersonal lives, but in our organizations and in our public systems and structures. Uh, we're really trying to think about how do we go beyond what the conversation has been around, uh, let's just get along to what does it really mean for us to deconstruct the world that we have all inherited and then together collectively reconstruct 
a world uh, that is big enough, a society that is big enough, a conversation that's big enough for all of the ways uh, that we show up to the story. And so we're, we're in the beginning of that. I, I spent, you know, about 15 years being engaged in um, a lot of direct action, justice work, uh, violence reduction work, trying to find ways to um, show up as a peacemaker in the conversation uh, around police uh, and black and brown communities. And, and so it, there's been a lot of time uh, spent getting it uh, right and wrong, um, being on the journey myself, um, and a little bit about you know myself in terms of what brought me into that conversation. Uh, you know, I'm I'm born and raised as a as a black storefront church Pentecostal, uh, third child of six, uh, with my mom and dad who've been married for uh, almost fifty years now, um, and grew up you know very much so trying to figure out what did it mean for us to be a people who was set apart by God to be in service. Uh, to the kingdom of God and the kingdom of God, as some of us have started to call it. What did it mean to be of service of, you know, to that in a way that wasn't just limited by staying uh, in our places of safety, like our churches or, or our affinity groups? And the older I got, I really tried to start figuring out what did it mean for me to take this faith that had so impacted my life and begin to engage in a world um, that needed peace, that needed love, um, that needed joy, that needed reconciliation, um, and, and finding ways to step out into that. And so after pastoring for about a decade uh, amongst a few churches and, and doing a lot of work with young adults and, um, and other ministries, I, I made a shift uh, where I stopped uh, pastoring in a church and shifted, you know, I think my expression of ministry into much more of a communal focus, uh, part of that included myself, my wife, and our three daughters relocating into what they were called the kill zone of East Oakland at that time to try to find ways to make peace in the middle of very violent circumstances. And I've just continued to be on the journey. Um, I don't know what all, uh, but what calls me to this is um, I firmly believe that God is seeking to make all things new in our world, uh, but that happens through uh, those who seek to follow uh, God. And, and for me, that means to follow the way of Jesus. So, you know, oftentimes I've told Jared this, you know, yeah, I've told you, man, like, I think the difficulty in, in the faith is that uh, everybody wants to be Jesus, but nobody wants to be John the Baptist, mm -hmm. you know, because John the Baptist gets his head cut off. He doesn't rise from the dead, right? He, he just gets the, the suffering of it. And so I think, um, but Jesus said that there was no greater prophet than John. And so I'm trying to find a way on how do I live in view of the resurrection of Jesus, but committed to the practice of John the Baptist to think about what does it mean for me to really um, serve the, the coming kingdom of God um, and hopefully do so in a way uh, where I don't allow the imperialism of our world uh, to possess me in the process. Mm -hmm. It's a great intro. I, there's a couple things I want to pull out and, and wonder with you about them. Um, but before before I do, I wonder if you if you'll share a story, um, and because I think it will resonate with with many of us who are listening in. Uh, I think a lot of us are, are are find ourselves in churches around the country where we're wondering like why 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 are why are we not talking about the real things that are happening in the streets of our country right now, or or if we are, is the best that we can do to like pray about it is there not more that we should be doing as people of the jesus way you know and i wonder if you would share that story of um it, it, it's kind of an origin story as i understand it of you being commissioned uh beyond the walls to be a person of good news in the streets of a person of, of, of restoration in, in the streets can you share that that story um where you're invited to extend your hand and pray and yeah, how that was not yeah. enough for you because I, I think people will resonate with that i think that's where people are yeah, well, I mean, but before that, what I would say, too, is I think it's important for us to, this is something I feel like the Spirit's been calling me back to, is to figure out how can we be um, gracious with each other? Because if we keep it all the way solid, right, um, as, as woke as some of us think that we are now, or as, as deep and ready as some of us think we are, we weren't always there. I wasn't always there, right? Somebody had to have some grace for me in some moments where success for me was gonna be wearing a five button suit and traveling around the country and being the next TD Jakes with some shiny shoes on to sell my product in the lobby. Like at a certain point, that was my sincere definition of success until the spirit was 
continued to move in me more and more relationships, gave me a wider lens, different things started breaking my heart and, and that opened me to more. So I just think it's easy for us to become cynical towards people who might have a smaller circle of human concern than we have at this moment. Um, and and we, it's easy to bang on them and, and talk about how horrible they are. But uh, I think what God's been showing me and inviting me into lately has been, you know, um, remember being all have seen and fallen short of the glory of God you have in the past. So what does it look like for you to have mercy for those that might still be on their journey, recognizing you still need mercy for the journey that you're on. Um, but I think the point mm -hmm. that the story you're talking about, Jared, that, that um, you know, I've talked about a lot is this notion where, you know, I'm on that journey to success being, you know, I want, I want to become this, this televangelist and, and I want to do my work. And 2006 is a year in Oakland, we got 148 murders in the city. And in our church, they said, let's all stretch our hands to the east. Let's pray that God stops the violence. We stretch our hands, we pray the prayer, and then we go back and they queue up praise Adonai and the guitars are strumming and everybody's having a good time. And I had this, this, aha in this moment that there has to be more that God was asking me to do than just stretch my hands towards the east. Um, but at that moment, I didn't know what I needed to do. I just knew that what I was currently doing wasn't good enough. And that started uh, a ball of momentum that that led, and see, it's the part of the story I normally don't tell Jared because it just gets too thick, right? But that, that started with me trying to have more serious conversations with the church that I was at and the pastor that I was, who was my mentor. And the more that I was having conversations with folks around what it is that we wanted to do with people that I deeply loved, folks who were hearing me try to push our church towards a different orientation and a wider circle of human concern, start saying, well, maybe you want to go do ministry somewhere else. You know, and I was effectively invited to, to go find a different job and to exit. go <laughs> to exit, right? And, and so, you know, normally when I'm telling this story and I'm just trying to get a presentation, you know, that that's a little too messy for it. But since we're on a little webinar with the fam, right? Like yeah, that, yeah. that's the that's the that's the inside part of the story, right? That I was basically invited to to leave. And so what became the invitation, I believe, from God to step into a different um, expression of, of the kingdom came at the cost of me experiencing a lot of pain personally with the relationships that I was hanging with, losing the church body. I mean, there was, there was a lot of loss and, and, and pain that happened there that took years to figure out how to restore some of those relationships. But in, in those years, I had a lot of animus, resentment, pain. And, and, and that's a part of the story that, you know, trying to say yes to God doesn't always mean that everybody that you're currently rocking with is going to understand that, but how we make meaning of what happens in the meantime, I think, uh, can contribute a lot to either to, to our availability to what God wants to do in the world or our cynicism and maybe, you know, becoming less of what God might be trying to invite us to be. Mm -hmm. That's super helpful. I wonder if we can get an amen in the comment section. <laughs> I, I know that some of you are thinking about this as well. You've had some moment like that, you know, where you've asked yourself, is this the best that we can do? Is this all? Uh, and that that's like a Genesis moment for you in your work of, of peacemaking. And then you found yourself moving, maybe being invited to or navigating away from your community of origin. That's been painful. And I, I, I got to say, there are a few peacemakers that I know, because I want to get to this John the Baptist bit in a second here, Ben. There are a few peacemakers that I know that along the journey of becoming a peacemaker um, didn't, didn't have to figure out how to navigate the pain um, of their communities or of origin saying, you're going to do what? Uh, it's, it's, a, it's almost like a necessary birthing into, into the work. And I love, Ben, that you, you even said now you've, you've actually gone back to restore some of those relationships, which we'll get to here in a second. Um, well, so, let me just uh, say this line too, but before you hit it, I, I think it's it's an important invitation for us. You know, Sister Valerie Carr, the the, the the Sikh sister, she has this powerful line that I think we as Christians can just hold. And she she says, maybe the darkness of the moment is not the darkness of a tomb, but the darkness of a womb. And and I think sometimes what happens when we get in these painful situations, we're experiencing the death of something when when God might actually be inviting us to the birth of something. So, you know, I, I think it's all about like, you know, Isaiah says, 
you know, remember not the former things, neither consider the things of old. Behold, I am doing a new thing. But to me, the key line of that is, shall ye not know it? Do you have the ability to perceive the new thing that I'm doing? Or are you only going to keep paying attention to the things that have happened in the past? And, and so um, I think if we can see the new thing, it doesn't mean it's not going to hurt. But I think if we can see the new thing, then there becomes the invitation to figure out how do we go through the valley of the shadow of death that we love to quote, but how do we actually go through it, not camp in it, but go through it and then find ways to have, you know, relationships restored, you know, where they can be, because sometimes mm -hmm. they can't. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Good word, man. Um, let, let's talk uh, just briefly. There are two things that you said earlier that, that I think really pertain to this conversation on interpersonal peacemaking. One thing is, it was just a, a semantics thing. You, you said kingdom, or as some of us are now referring to it as kingdom. Reflect on that a little bit, because that, I think that is the epicenter of what we're talking about here with the priority of relationship. Um, and then, uh, yeah, hit that first, and then, I, and then I want to talk about John the Baptist a little bit, then we'll dive deeper. Yeah, no, nah, I'll be quick, because you know I can ramble on. If, if y'all was hung with me and Jared, I could have 15 minute conversations turn into two hour rambles. I don't, I don't know how much meaning is coming out of them. It's very meaningful for us, but it's you know, wonderful. I don't know it's, if it's, <laughs> it's, it's just like two philosophical people sitting on the side. Um, but I mean, when I think about kingdom and kingdom, uh, I, I recognize language being important and the whole term of kingdom has really been starting to be pushed to me by folks from the other who've been inviting me to think about the notion of what we've understood as kingdom is oftentimes rooted in the notion of imperialism and power and authority that might that language might miss what Jesus was really inviting us into, which was more about egalitarian family and a sense of belonging and a sense of um, actually disappearing the, the human hierarchical structures that actually fracture our relationships. And maybe Jesus was inviting us uh, to, to imagine a world that didn't have a different Pharaoh, but actually a world that had no Pharaoh. Um, and when we think about the whole notion of the revelation with the, where the lion is laying down with the lamb, like what, what Jesus is inviting us into is, is something very different than what we've experienced, different from how our government's been set up, the way we think about creating organization and, 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 and even family, that somehow somebody has to have the power and other people have to be dominated. And so I've, I've, um, I understand what Jesus is talking about, the kingdom in the scriptures. He's using language based upon what they understand. But what I've been trying to get to the heart of is not just what are the words that Jesus used, but what was Jesus really trying to communicate? What's he really maybe trying to invite you and I into? Mm -hmm. Spot on, man. Spot on. Thanks. That's, that's helpful. I wonder if there are questions that are surfacing for those of you who are listening in right now um, around that. I, I heard uh, a woman named Emma Piercy uh, in, in London talk about this as well. And she really lifted up, like you, like you just said, Ben, this idea of, of hierarchy and power and dominance that, that are implied with this idea of kingdom and the oneness, the belonging, the interconnectedness, the interdependence uh, that I think come with the idea of kingdom. And, uh, and I wonder how the words have shaped our understanding of what it's all about, you know, and this world that Jesus is actually ushering in. Um, in, in talking about John the Baptist, and this, you, you and I have, have pontificated a lot uh, about this with one another. And, um, and it's actually been really helpful for me uh, to consider John the Baptizer as, as one who, uh, who pointed to Jesus and the way of Jesus, uh, most notably in John 3.30 saying, um, I must decrease, he must increase, you know? So like, I love this. What I see in John the Baptizer though, and what I want you to, uh, to wonder about with us is his work was invitational and disruptive. And I think there's a misconception in the work of peacemaking that, uh, well, I think uh, a misconception of peacemaking is that it's peacekeeping, which means that we maintain the unjust status quo. We just make sure that everybody stays quiet about it. Uh, that's peacekeeping is not peacemaking. Um, and I, I see in John the Baptizer, this mix, this tension of invitation and disruption. And, and I wonder how you think about that as a peacemaker um, and, and I, I see if it, like land this in the interpersonal space because I and play, you can play it on systemically as well because it, we need it to be there but like how do you hold that tension as a peacemaker of invitation and disruption it's, it's tough I think because um, binaries are easy um, generalizations are easy 
um, either you're in or out, your friend or foe, um, your ally or enemy, right? These these frames are much easier. They 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 you know some of the work that I've got a chance to to do and learn from with, with Sister Dr. Jennifer Everhart from Stanford, who does work around implicit bias. I encourage folks to get her book biased if you're looking for reading material. But she talks about like how our brain looks for these easy fixes because at the end of the day, our brain is trying to figure out how to deliver us safety, security, and food. So our, 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 our physiology is doing some stuff that we need to figure out how to help our spirit get empowered to not be dominated by our physiology and just our biology, which we know can get us in trouble on a variety of different fronts. But I think the way that it's, it's lived for me is, is trying to really think about how do, you, how do I live in the intersection of being hard on systems and soft on people? Right, like so it's, there's, there's this notion like, I wanna be hard on systems, but I gotta be soft on the people that are inside the systems. Hard, hard, and, and as a black dude, you know, who is the, the product of, of a 500 year failed experiment around the notion of belonging, um, it, it can be easy for me. Um, some might argue just, you know, in, in my own racial identity, justifiable for me to just be hard on systems and hard on people because of the pain, right? But I feel like with this, the spirit's invitation, is I'm gonna be hard on systems, I'm gonna be soft on people. And I, I don't, I see it. And this is where I've had to go back to draw my strength from. Because when, when I stopped rocking with, with the scriptures as my main source of engaging in this justice work, it, it put me in a very dim place, uh, mm -hmm. uh, a, a place where, you know, I was burning out and, and becoming depressed because I was, I felt like I was more relating to the justice movement at the tree of knowledge of good and evil rather than relating to the justice work from the tree of life. And I think when you eat from the wrong tree, you're going to end up with the wrong um, fruit and, and the wrong outcomes. But, you know, when I, when I look back at John the Baptist, John the Baptist, let me use John the Baptist, I, I, I love the Jerry saying that because, you know, John won the Baptist or Methodist. I would, I want John to be a Pentecostal, but that was too, it was, he was too early in the story. But, uh, but we look at John the Baptist, right? You, you look at this notion that he's he's strong on condemning the system of oppression that is happening around them. And yet we find in Luke 3, where, where they are asking, well, what must somebody do? And he is inviting the Roman soldier, right? The police officer of our day to think about how they should enter a path to mm -hmm. repentance. He is inviting the Pharisee. He, so he is both critiquing imperialism hard on systems and inviting the Roman soldier soft on people, right? And, and he is the one that Jesus says, there's no greater prophet or expression of someone who is trying to bring in the kingdom of God is someone who is living in that tension. And um, I think the tough part of that, like the language that I use for, for peacemaking um, has been where, where my language has evolved is bridging. Like I talk about this notion of what does it mean for us to bridging is not about compromise because compromise to me is the notion of less of what you brought, less of what I brought. And we're going to find the, the, the lesser of it that we can settle for. To me, bridging is about how do we actually hold a full version of the person who I've seen as the other. I hold the full version of myself and we figure out what is this new third way or the opportunity that we've not yet realized that happens when we when we come together. And, and it's this kind of energy, I really believe that we need to restore relationships to, to restore society. It's not about some group trying to get more power than the other group so that they can dominate and force their way of being on another group. Uh, we've got to figure out something harder. But when, when you think about bridging, and, and Bell Hooks says this, uh, Black, Black feminist author, great reading if anybody wants to pull her up. But Bell Hooks, when she talks about bridging, she says, bridges are made to be walked on. And, and I think the hard part when we think about peacemaking and bridging, it's not, it is not the attractive role. It, it's, it's, you're going to get much more celebrated uh, by throwing red meat to folks yeah. and 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 clarifying who the other is and and rooting yourself in self righteous, but to actually humanize the other, to actually engage in the practice of enemy love, which is unique to our right. following of Jesus, yeah. um, that that then it's going to invite us into a new way of being, and that work, as I've tried to engage in it as a black dude messing around with the police. 
as a as a father and a clergy person messing around with young brothers who've been involved with being perpetrators of gun violence in the streets in the middle of the protest community being able to see the perceived other humanize them see them with all the divinity that god made them and find that third way is hard but i think it's critical if we're going to get to belonging rather than just an updated version of the same broken dehumanizing thing that we've all been experiencing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so what comes to my mind then is is this one time when we were walking in the streets of Oakland, um, and I think at that time it was connected to Oscar Grant. And uh, do you remember we we were marching, and then um, the Oakland police basically said enough with this march, and they blocked the street. That was Post and Ferguson. That was po was that Post Ferguson? Mike Brown. Yeah. Mike Brown. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I remember in that moment we're literally putting we're marching in the streets uh calling shedding light on a broken system and when they when the police set that line up i watched you hold that line between police and 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 very, tired police and very angry protesters and from my point of view that was a moment where i watched you be hard on systems, soft on people, because I watched, I watched the way that you looked, with, looked at and engaged the police officers in particular. Um, and the way that you spoke with them um, was, was invitational. So really, really like nuts and bolts gritty here. You're a black man holding the line between angry protesters and a system that has occupied and oppressed you and your people for hundreds of years. How in that moment, because lots of us are probably sitting here thinking, man, it's hard for me to look my brother in the eye, like my literal, my literal blood brother, because you know that thing happened like twelve years ago, and and I'm, I don't want to downplay that. It's real, but it's because it's real, and and most of us have forgotten what happened twelve years ago. All all we know is that like I've got to win in this relationship, right? We, I struggle to see the humanity, dignity, and image of God in my brother. You are now, I watch you face to face with the, the emblem of your occupation, looking at them and, and very obviously seeing the image of the divine. H how do you do that? In, in, a, in a moment like that, what is the work that's happening in you that makes th that moment in that storm, uh, makes it possible for you to see the divine in that person? Yeah, so practically I would say that navigating storms um, and storm-like moments uh, don't happen in those moments. They happen in the preparation before you arrive at storms. So to me, it's about um, the, what, what gave me the capacity to see those uh, police officers as human beings as a part of a broken system was the work that I had been doing before that to get proximate to human beings who were police officers. Mm -hmm. um, and learn how to hear other stories, right? And so, and, and what that needed to do in me was to engender some empathy, that intersecting with some surrender to God and recognizing that uh, Christ invites me in the Lord's Prayer um, to ask for forgiveness of my sins, but also to forgive those who have sinned against me. Um, and and that, that I can't, I can't, um, and, and, and in the Sermon on the Mount, is I'm invited that like to be careful with my judgment, recognizing that the same measure of mercy that that I give out is the same measure that is brought back to me. So I, I think in these moments, it's it's about what are you what are you doing in your in your becoming time, right? In your own spiritual practices that are helping you have uh, a a bigger account of mercy for storm like moments. Now, I think even when we get in storm-like moments, we could still have a lot of mercy and, and it can be tough to engage it. I, I invite us to stop, to pause, mm -hmm. right? Um, in, in moments of great tension, to pause and allow uh, some space for you to see what's possible rather than seeing what's not possible. That's where I think you guys framework of like, see this, this notion of seeing, right? Mm -hmm. Um, because there's oftentimes more opportunities available to us when we're in tense interpersonal situations, mm -hmm. but we got to pause to see, right? And, and I think as people that follow Jesus, we're invited to see the humanity 
of everyone, including our enemy. This is why I feel like the notion of enemy love is so critical for us, right? Because I've sat with some of our non-Christian brothers and sisters in faith who have told me that's unique to y'all. That ain't our way, right? And I'm not saying that to be, you know, uh, uh, religiously supremacist, but I, I do think there's some invitation in this Jesus way of, of, of the of where we've got to reach down to. So like in that moment that you're pointing to with the cops, I had to pause, see that there was more uh, possible than, than what my anger and my justified rage saw, recognizing that the spirits in, is in the prophetic um, um, critique and the frustration and, all, and the lament that the spirit is there, but I also had to recognize that the spirit is also there in the sense of, um, uh, caring for and having value for the person who I perceive to be my enemy, mm-hmm. that, that, that the spirit of God is not just with me. Mm-hmm. The spirit of God is with all of God's creation. Mm-hmm. Come on, man. And, and I got to, I got to hold that and I got to figure out what's the best way that I can honor God in both my perceived ally mm-hmm. and my perceived enemy. Mm-hmm. How do I honor the God in them both? Um, and this is where I talk, this is where the, the, the sacrifice comes in, because in, in those moments, it's about what does it mean for me to serve God in this moment, not serve myself, not serve my self-interest, not serve what feels comfortable, what does it mean for me to serve God in this moment, um, and, and there's not always one size fits all, that's the other thing I would say, like, you know, you could put me in that same scenario tomorrow, And there might be a different response. So like what I don't want to offer is like just these notions of, okay, so if I get in scenario A, this is how I'm supposed to behave. What I'm inviting us to do, pause, see, Mm. listen to God. How do you honor the spirit of God that is showing up in both your perceived ally and your perceived enemy? Yeah, Yeah. Ben, it's like, um, do do we dare to believe that the spirit of God is actually restoratively at work in every corner of the cosmos, even in that moment? You know, and um, and, and because well, what, well, what, especially if, especially Jer, if if we really believe that God is reconciling all things, right? So like, so either we believe that, or we just been foaming at the mouth, right? But if if we really believe that God is reconciling all things, that means God is also trying to reconcile my perceived enemy. Yeah, that's it. Because that means I also got to remember. I mean, I, I believe the book says that we were all enemies of God. Yeah, that's it, man. That's Ephesians. And, and, and we've been reconciled, yeah. right? So like, and, and I've said this when, when I've talked over them, but I was like, so we believe, we like those of us that follow Jesus, we believe some pretty radical things, right? We, we believe in a virgin birth. We, we believe that, that somebody was crucified on the Roman cross, died, came back to life and ascended to heaven but we scared to confront the police. We scared to see the police as human. We scared to engage with our neighbor. I mean, we, we, we have fear about these very practical things while at the same time believing these very uh, yeah. extraordinary things. Yeah. And I don't say that in judgment. I say the invitation that the same faith that we access to believe that Jesus raised from the dead, maybe we dig into that same vault to believe that God can reconcile my relationship with my family member. God can reconcile uh, my relationship with myself. God can give me the grace to be able to have a wider circle of human concern for somebody that has a different sexual orientation that may agree or not agree with your theology. Like that that if, if, if all of that power I can tap into for the resurrection, maybe I can tap into some of that for a broken marriage. Maybe I can tap into some of that for stuff I'm trying to change in society. And that fault, I think, should be accessible for all. Of you. Yeah, 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 man. And that, and, and that's where, like, I think it's really important for us as peacemakers to to grow in in, in our tactics and in our skills and, and this or that. But w- that what you're raising up, from my point of view, is in every single moment of conflict or injustice that we find ourselves in is going to present itself differently. Are we riding the wind of the spirit into that space? And is our is is restoration like our restorative impulse the natural habit, the natural impulse mm. of our lives yet, you know? And um, and it doesn't mean that even if it is, it doesn't mean that the relationship's going to get restored or the broken thing's going to get fixed. But am I riding the wind of the spirit such that when the moment happens, the continuation of my life is restorative? 
you know, mm-hmm. my perspective toward that other, I refuse to see that person as my enemy, you know, which, which our sister, brothers and sisters at the Tent of Nations would, would say. I refuse I to be enemies, mm-hmm. you know. Um, and so, and, and a, part, a part of that, I think, is a truth that I think, I think the gospel is really trying to call us to is, and, and one of my mentors, John Powell, uh, 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 somebody, if, if you don't know John Powell, Google John Powell, Other Than Belonging Institute, re- really great work. I mean, he's really influenced me a lot about this notion of belonging. But one of the things he talks about is that there is no other, right? Like we, we've been socialized that there are others. There's us and there's them. But I think the truth and what Christ was calling us to is there is no other right? Like we are all neighbors towards one another, right? Living inside a broken system that God is seeking to reconcile, right? That doesn't mean that the violence that shows up needs to be disappeared. That doesn't mean that the ugliness, like the stuff that, that we saw, you know, on January 6th and, and, and white supremacist stuff marching through the rotunda need to be disappeared. But it, it does, I think, invite us into this notion of, of recognizing that that even those people, and, and I'll tell y'all, it, it hurts me a little bit even to say it, right? Because this is still some of my grown edges, that even those people yeah. are the children of God. Come on, man. 100%. That's hard. That's, That's hard. hard, though. That's hard. Yeah. Because in my, in my flesh, and maybe I, I, I used to like this, I used to say in my spirit, but it ain't in my spirit. It's just all in my flesh. I'm going to bust one of them upside the head, right? Let's just keep it all the way solid, right? But yeah. but I have to recognize they are the children of God. And this is where, like, I, I really love Dr. King's tutelage for all of us, I believe, is um, the ability to recognize. I, I, I was in a, in a meeting with Andrew Young, who was one of the folks who, who was a part of the SCLC and, and, you know, one of Dr. King's best friends. And he's 87 years old now. We were in a meeting. And, and he said, uh, we were all in a, in after one of the marches, he said the white folks had, had just been horrible to us and we're sitting around eating and we're, we're just all complaining about how racist and terrible they were. He said, and Dr. King came out and, and said, uh, can I say something? And they were like, yeah. And he was like, um, he said, uh, racism is a disease. And he said, uh, our white brothers, who are diseased with racism are no more inferior than we are superior in our ability to spot it. Mm. We were both born into this condition. Mm. He said, now, if we're not careful and we will allow hatred into our hearts, he said, then we will find ourselves, even as we pursue our own liberation, that ultimately will invite white people to pursue their own liberation. If we take hatred in our hearts, then we will get into the promised land and we'll have carried over the same thing that we are seeking to get away from. Mm-hmm. And, and I thought it was, it was this real profound like look into like a conversation with all of these civil rights legends that nobody saw that was just happening in the living room over some cornbread and fried chicken. Of, of, of Martin inviting them to, to really think about this notion that um, everyone is God's children. And even when people are showing up as violent and hateful, that, that that does not diminish how God sees them. Man. And, and, and if God sees them as redeemable, and if I say I follow that God, mm-hmm. then I must love what God loves, mm-hmm. even the one with whom I despise. And, and this to me is the, when I talk about becoming, you know, Jeremy, you talk about becoming all the time. Mm-hmm. Like to me, this is why I feel like I'm ever in process because there was a time that, you know, I, I didn't have a deep love for the young brother who was shooting at somebody in the neighborhood until I got proximate. And, and now I, I, I'm in a lot of deep relationships with young brothers who have been involved in gun violence. Um, because I was able to see that God loved them and I had to love them the way that God loves them, um, despite the violence they were showing up with. So, you know, um, I, I, I don't want to get on my soapbox, but I just no. want to invite us to recognize that yeah. we're all on a journey. Yeah. And I, I think the, the invitation is for us to make sure as much as we can not to get rooted in our self-righteousness, but rather get rooted in God's righteousness. Mm. Come on, man. And that, like, I, I just wonder for those of you who are listening and like, what, what are the, what are the, 
the poignant ideas here for us. Like I'm, I'm sitting here listening, going, ah, this, the distinctiveness of enemy love, the essential nature of proximity, or in my case, if there's one group of people that are hardest for me to love right now, let's like, we can actually, we actually know who I know who that group of people is. I don't have to wonder uh, what does it take to get proximate to them? And, right. um, and so Ben, I, I do wonder if you could get like sink this into practicalities here, because um, I do know you as someone who you're getting proximate to the high volume shooter. You're getting proximate to the law enforcement um, officer. You're getting proximate to the white pastor who doesn't think that that racism is an institutional reality, you know, like, and it, you're getting proximate to these people. And I know that that's exhausting too. Um, mm -hmm. it is. But, but let's talk about that, pro about proximity and um, how, and, and land this in, in the bridging difference space. Like how do you get proximate to people with whom you pretty adamantly disagree? What's your approach there? And, um, and what's your pace? Talk to us about your approach and your pace. Yeah, so I think in order to get to bridging, one of the things you have to do, there's a step before that, and we like to call it building shared humanity. And, and the image that I've been using for that is to create a table. John Powell says that we should build a table that is large enough for everyone's suffering. And I love that because what it holds is that everyone has suffering, not just me. Everyone has suffering and we need to build a table that's large enough for it. So to me, a big part of it has been, how do we curate spaces, right? Spaces could be calls like this. Spaces could actually be physical spaces. Spaces could be meeting. Spaces could be where I actually go show up physically where my perceived other exists. And I go to listen to God and I go to listen for, um, with eyes to see their humanity. So that might mean showing up in places that I've either been invited to or that I seek to invite myself in, not for the purpose of judgment, but for the purpose of learning, for the purpose of, of becoming, right? So, so we, we, we really invite folks to think about how you're building spaces. Bridging is what happens in these spaces, right? So when I get in that space, the, the invitation sometimes is, I'm gonna enter that space with a perceived goal in mind we've all been socialized like that like mm -hmm. what do i want to get out of this right what what's we, we have a predetermined idea of what success looks like and then we're in essence what we try to do often is just convert the other to our point of view mm -hmm. that's not bridging what what bridging is about is i'm going to show up as my full self um and i am going to hold this other person's point of view. Holding it doesn't mean I agree with it. Holding it doesn't mean I affirm it, but I'm gonna do my best to try to hold and understand how they see the world. And I'm gonna be vulnerable in creating this space for them to hold my truth and how I see the world. Now here's where bridging gets tough. There's no guarantee when you seek to bridge that the other person will be courageous enough to hold your point of view. But, but that is what bridging requires, is the vulnerability, is the risk-taking. That if I show up as a full human being, right, that, that, and if I take the risk, you will take the risk to hold me. And if we both will hold one another's point of view, that happens through discussion, that happens through deep listening, emotional intelligence. It happens with seeking to understand over seeking to be understood. If, if we will engage in some of those, it's not just discussions that bridging oftentimes can mean we're going to begin to show up in places together. It means that we're going to begin to um, uh, diversify our experiences. I'm going to get close to your experience. You're going to get close to my experience. We're going to walk together. We're going to journey together. And through that, that integrated um, practice over the course of time, we will begin to discover what is the way forward um, that actually holds how you've come to this intersection and how I've come to this intersection that then leads us to what I like to call belonging, which is, so once we get clear about what needs to happen based that, that actually is it, it holds where you've come from and holds where I've come from, then we could look at where we are and make some decisions together about how we deconstruct what is and how we need to reconstruct what needs to be that is actually uh, a derivative of, of the journey that we've been on with each other. But what you guys are all hearing is something that takes time, right? Wow. This, like in order to 
So the, the, the challenges in our families, in our, in our communities, in our public uh, systems and structures, this is not gonna be, um, you know, a, a, a two, three, four punch conversation to, to reconcile 400 years of dehumanization of black people in America uh, is, 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 is gonna be a journey, right? To, to, so I, I think we, we have to enter into that space. And then when we talk about belonging, it's, it's really about how do we do so culturally and structurally, right? So we wanna figure out how we create belonging, uh, you know, where, we, where we all can show up in the way in which we engage with one another interpersonally, but then structurally we have to do that because similar to a human body, you know, I like to say the structure is the skeleton, the culture is all the organs and everything else. You need structures and systems. You need a skeleton in order to stand a human body up. And so we need to create systems and structures that help protect what it is that we're trying to do with one another. But that bridging, if, if there's any point that I say is most crucial, this is where the peacemaking comes in. Mm -hmm. It is about risk taking, it's about vulnerability. It, it is about sacrifice at times. Now, the, the, the one way that I would nuance that is I think it's important for us all to recognize that everybody is not always ready to bridge. Some people are not looking to bridge at all. So let me give you an example. When I was rocking with the police, right, there was about a third of the police department that was not looking to bridge. They were fine with, you know, less, less. You know, I, I was actually in a training before where a police officer said in one of the discussion, um, he was like, yeah, I, I, I want the people in the community. He was talking about a black community. I want the white police officer. He said, I want the people in the community to be scared of me because I want to make sure I go home at night. So I, I dress and put on all of my riot gear and all of that when I don't have to because I want to intimidate them because I want them to be scared of me. All right. He was not looking to bridge. Right. But what I also found when I was training police officers is there's a third of them that were looking to bridge. They, they were saying, hey, I don't understand everything about my system. I haven't understand the full history of it. Um, I'm, I'm understanding more as you're training, as you're bridging with me. I want to share with you a little bit about our experience and how I've been trained. I remember having a white police officer named Mike, who was a detective, stopped me the next day after he saw me in the training. He's like, hey, are you the guys that hold the guy that held up the shoes in the training? Because I used to do this training where I would hold up shoes and tell them, I don't know what it feels like to walk in your shoes. I only know what it feels like to walk in these shoes, but I want to figure out how we have a conversation to get your shoes and my shoes on the journey. We go, both belong to. He said, so aren't you guys help shoes? I said, yeah. He's like, man, I argued with my wife for two hours last night about your presentation. He was like, but you got me. I'm in. I, I want to I wanna do what it is that you're inviting us to do. They don't train us this way. He was talking about structurally, uh, systemically. It's like, they don't train us to, to do this, but I want to do what it is. How do we get there? So you had those two groups. And then I like to talk about what I oftentimes would find is who I call the ambivalent middle. So there's a third that didn't want to bridge, there's a third that wanted to bridge, and then there's a third in the middle that's going to go whichever way the, the, the either bridgers or the non-bridgers influence. So, you know, I think it's important for us to recognize when people don't want to bridge, like Jesus said, shake the dust off your feet. But what does Jesus say? He doesn't say shake the dust off your feet and never bridge again. He says shake the dust off your feet and go to the next town. Get on with it. Look look for the next bridging opportunity, yeah. right? So go, preach the good news, mm -hmm. seek to be reconciled. If it doesn't work out, that doesn't mean you, you missed it. It means you go to the next town and look for the next opportunity. Yeah, yeah. and that, that's a good segue into a question I'm reading. Um, Bob, Bob says, you mentioned that some relationships cannot be restored um, or, or are, aren't being restored. How do I hold grace for the relationships as I continue to hang with the relationship or should I not expend any more energy on these relations, the relationships that don't seem redeemable? Um, mm. what, how would you interact with that? Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, it, it's, that's a deep question. Um, I think context informs that, right? So if I'm having a difficult relationship with one of my children, with one of my siblings, with a parent. Um, for me, I don't, I don't know that it's, it's as easy for me to just go, okay, I got to walk away from this. Um, now that comes out of my own personal ethic around the notions of family. Um, if I'm trying to bridge with, you know, someone in a communal way or, or in an interpersonal way that's not in my family circle, I might make some different choices around, um, is this a relationship uh, that I feel like um, 
I really feel like God is really pushing on me to seek redemption in. Um, and if I'm not feeling that strong spiritual sense of calling, or if I'm not feeling that deep physical sense of necessity, um, it might be uh, one that I walk away from. And, you know, I, I remember there was a, a, a white evangelical pastor who I used to be friends with and we would have conversations around race and all of that. And then after I did a big protest uh, on the freeway uh, about five years ago, you know, he, he made some comments to the folks at this church, he used to have me preach at this church and got back to me, he made some comments that I was a heretic and, you know, Ben McBride will never preach at this church again, blah, blah, blah. And uh, it was super hurtful to me, um, particularly because of all the very private personal conversations that we had had um, and, and it just felt to me like he was just, you know, eating Trump Cheerios and, and, you know, not, not being a good friend. And then he, he reached out to me last summer after, um, George Floyd was murdered and was like, Hey, you know, I want to have a conversation. And, uh, I didn't respond, um, because in the vulnerable place that I was in, um, engaging with him, wasn't going to enable me to take care of myself. So I, I think some of this is, is about, um, trying to listen to the spirit, trying to listen to yourself. Um, I, don't, I don't believe that, um, that the spirit is asking us to, to, to uh, do harm to ourselves um, if, if, if there is no, if there is an invitation into redemption. So I don't know, it, it's, mm -hmm. I might sound a little, sound a little bit contradictory because I think, you know, I'm living both with, with, uh, trying to figure out how to follow God and, and some of what I'm learning from being in therapy and trying to figure out how to be good to myself. So, you know, that, that, that might be something we all need to figure out how to do is right. get a little bit therapy too. <laughs> that, that's, but that's it. That's it. I mean, that's what I, I really appreciate that at the tail end there, Ben, because we're all trying to figure this out. We're all trying to sort it out. Like, I don't know any, I don't know any peacemakers that are like, I nail it every single time. I'm, I'm, my intuition is always right. I, I, I stepped out at the right time. I stepped back in. Like we're all going, I don't, I don't know completely. I throw myself on the mercy of God and I'm going to continue to try to live with restorative intent and I might make some mistakes. And yeah, so yeah. really briefly, how do you have grace with yourself in that regard? You know, because, because I, there's a drive that we have. Like if, if we're, if we're peacemakers, we never give up on, relationships we never step away right and maybe that's that i think that's a myth because i think like we become the cost of that so how do you how do you give yourself grace to be like no i'm actually okay with taking a step away or taking a break or actually shaking the dust off yeah so uh, what what i the invitation i've been taking is something that my first therapist invited me into is he said that big container of grace you have to give everybody else that example i gave us a little bit earlier about c the 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 divinity that is showing up in your perceived ally and enemy. I think the other invitation is for us to see that also in ourselves, that we are not a commodity used by God in service to something, but we are also uh, a part of God's creation. And so um, I, I think that if we will uh, listen to the spirit um, we, and, and listen to those that God has put around our lives, um, We'll, we'll, we'll get those invitations that maybe it's time to take a break. And, and for me, what that's looked like is, you know, I, I took a significant break. I, I shut things down for a few months last year and I've repositioned myself in terms of, of how I think I want to be relating to the peacemaking conversation based upon what I believe the, the spirit is inviting me into. And I think, I, I think what, what's important to keep central is the notion of God is the central is the notion of community. And I think those can be good um, points of resonance to invite us into the way of being. Right on, right on. Well, let me hit us with a couple of um, resources that are gonna be coming your way and then Ben, you, uh, you get the last word um, with us. One, uh, those of you who are listening in uh, and uh, you're gonna receive a, a follow-up email with access to the recording of this, we wanna encourage you to, uh, to use this within your spheres of influence, whether it's a small group, it's your faith community, it's a team at your organization, whatever it is, to think about these thoughts a little bit more deeply and then to integrate these learnings into living. That's the point here. Let's not just consume and be inspired. Let's actually sit, take some next steps together. And so you'll have the, the recording to, um, to use that as a tool. As I've mentioned, the, there's a live debrief session that's coming up on June the 8th from six to seven uh, Pacific Standard Time. Registration is in the link tree that you see in the, in the chat thread. And again, this is, this, is a, this is a next step, right? So we've been in this conversation 
this is an opportunity to now connect and work out, start to work out the becoming piece. Like who must we become in order to live, love and lead this restorative way? And so that's where that conversation is gonna go. So it's just for the first 25 folk who register. Um, so get your seat at that table by registering right now. Um, Robbie Damelin in part four, uh, Israeli peacemaker. Robbie lost, a, uh, lost her son to the occupation over there and instead of choosing revenge has given her life to reconciliation. And she's gonna talk about that, but what's gonna be unique about that conversation is that Ravi as an Israeli Jew um, is gonna talk about that from the perspective of dominant culture. What does it mean to be a part of the, ocup the occupying community and do the work of peacemaking? Who has she had to become in order to do that work? And so that's gonna be a super dynamic conversation as well as thinking through how do we transcend the physical and sociological barriers and boundaries and walls that are in our families and our workspaces, our faith communities, our neighborhoods um, for the sake of relationship. And so that's what that conversation is gonna look like. I encourage you to, to register for that um, on June 10th. And then if we have any faith leaders in the space, uh, if you're interested in learning how Global Immersion is gonna be workshopping the ideas, the themes, the practices of this Restoring Friendship webinar series into the fall, um, if you go to our link tree right now, you'll be able to um, sign up for a free 30 minute consultation to talk with us about how we're thinking about this and how we can help tailor make and design some work, uh, some workshopping for you and your community. And so uh, the, all of those resources are accessible for you to take some next steps. We encourage you to do so. Um, ben, it's been uh, it's been a gift, and 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 this is this has been cool because, like, just to peer under the hood a bit with you, you know, and um, and think about these things at this very deep, very personal level, um, is is a real gift um, that you've given me and you've given us. So thank you. I'll give you the um, the last word and encourage encourage our sisters and brothers here who are, are wanting to yeah. tend to this in their everyday life. Well, I appreciate the invitation to be with y'all and uh, and to be able to just talk without uh, performance. I, I didn't have to turn on my Reverend Big McBride, and I just did get a chance to just talk, which is which is which is cool. Um, and I, I would just invite us to to hold the notion that um, it's a false choice that has been offered us that the only way to find safety is to be segregated from those who you're in conflict with. It's a false choice. Um, I actually believe that the way we find safety is not through being segregated from those different from us or those we're in conflict with, but actually by doing the work of peacemaking and bridging to be integrated with those who we see as the perceived other um, and to find a new peace that's available, uh, remembering that peace is not the absence of tension, but it is the presence of justice. Um, and so I just would send you all with this encouragement um, that this isn't something that we have to learn it's actually something that we have to remember. Um, when you look at two kids in the sandbox, they can fight with each other and find ways to get reconciled with one another because we're hardwired to be connected with one another. John Powell even says that when we come into this world, you don't even come into this world as an individual. You literally come into this world connected to another human being. So let us allow that connection, that spiritual and metaphorical umbilical cord that connects us all let us lean into that. Let's invite the spirit to lead us in that uh, so that we can continue to restore friendships, uh, join God in the world God is making. Amen and amen. Thanks, friends. See you again. Thanks, Be sure.